Hi, this is Nando from CNC Commentaries, and you're listening to CNC Movie Breakdowns. On this episode, we're going to be looking at the movie Black Klansman. I'm joined today by my co-host, Chase. Oh, hey, that's me. Yeah. How's it going? Not bad, Chase. How are you? I'm, I'm doing lovely, you know. Excited to talk about this movie with you, and... Uh... It's going to be great. Yeah. All right, Chase. We're going to be looking at Black Clansman today. Can you please give us a synopsis of this movie? I suppose I can. Um, Black Klansman uh, came out in 2018. It is a. Uh, it's based on some for real, for real shit. Um, it's the story of um, Ron Stallworth, an African American detective in the Colorado Springs Police Department, and um, he uh, kind of sets out to infiltrate. Um, certain sector of the KKK there in Colorado and um, he becomes a member and with the help of his uh, fellow associate Flip uh, they infiltrate and uh, wreck shit that is very true <laughs> uh, you indeed. Nando yeah. what did you think about this movie the first time you saw it uh, I actually saw this movie when it came out in theaters. Oh, fancy. You know, back when you could actually go to the movie theaters. <laughs> uh, I thought that this movie was pretty good. And I, it, gave a, it gave a pretty good impression on me because, obviously, it, this movie's got some really good acting, some really good directing. So, it was definitely a standout movie of that year. And it, I thought I found it really interesting because it was also a true story. And I think this uh, a story of a black man pretending, or with the help of a white man, and they both infiltrate the KKK. I find that to be really interesting. I agree. What about you, Chase? Uh, I also remember seeing this in 2018, and it was one of my favorite films of that year. I agree with you. I found it crazy how something like this could actually happen and um i just i it's it's probably up there in terms of the spike lee films i've seen and uh i was well we'll talk about this later but i was rooting for it big at the, the oscars that year yeah i guess without further ado let's uh let's jump in all right so very start of this movie we have a white supremacist propaganda film yes you know this movie definitely starts off you know this movie doesn't hold back (laughs) i start and uh the guy i forget the character's name but is it's played by alec baldwin Mm -hmm. and it's uh basically a pretend uh propaganda film and what i love about it is you don't it's not cut you just see well i mean it's cut but you see the guy's flubs and mistakes when he's trying to record it and like what's that line so can you tell me that line again yeah he keeps forgetting his lines it's almost as if we're seeing the bloopers yeah it's very cartoonish yeah kind of and uh it's also, as he's talking, you know, there's overlay of, like, scenes from Birth of a Nation playing, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, he talks about communism, and then his face screen goes red, and it's yeah. little things like that. So he's just, like, popping off with all of this white supremacist jargon, and, yeah, as you said, when he starts talking about communism, the screen turns red. Ooh. Fancy. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, as you said earlier, the, the, like, the propaganda film isn't cut, so we're seeing all the bloopers where he asks, like, oh, what's his line? Oh, how do I say this line? Oh, what does this word mean? Yeah. I mean, and I think the point is, obviously, to to make this person out and other people later as cartoon, so cartoonish and, like, how, how can you really think these things? And I don't even think if you know what that means and yeah. just 
over the top cartoonish racism yeah sometimes. and i think that's done intentionally like i i remember the first time i saw this movie i didn't think that some of the characters were real because i really didn't believe that somebody could be this over the top and cartoonishly racist well i mean and uh I, i'm pretty sure most of these people are fictional but i imagine very directly yeah i mean inspired these, yeah these some some of the characters are fictional but they're based on real people yeah like direct ins- inspiration mm-hmm. all right so after you have this you know white supremacist propaganda film you cut to ron stallworth our main character i love this opening shot of him and him yeah. he's looking up at the camera and he's fixing his hair mm-hmm. and then just the the title comes and it's like this is based on some for real shit yeah and then it cuts to this interview scene and i like this interview scene you know you've got the chief of police who's play i don't know who he's played by but he's this older white man and then you've got another police uh like police related man and it's another black man and then ron stallworth is being interviewed mm-hmm. and you know they go into these questions and the police chief is kind of not wanting to bring out the big questions first because colorado springs the city that this takes place in has never had like a black officer yeah this is a major first if he's going to let this happen yeah and so of course uh the older black guy he's saying like oh what are you gonna do if you get called like the n-word and stuff like that so you know he's very forthcoming yeah and we see like this conference like these this confrontation type of thing later on with um i forget the name of the officer but there's that one officer i think it's uh, officer landers yeah right who is obviously has it out for uh ron yeah he's a real racist piece of shit yeah he's a piece of shit and then you know so like we see these confrontations not just with like potentially people he's gonna go catch but also within the actual station i think that's done intentionally like ron stallworth is literally infiltrating the kkk and uh he also has to face the KKK, who, you know, are very well known well, for being he, racist. He's not even assigned to that, first yeah. off. He, they want to put him in narcotics, mm-hmm. which... Um, which, I mean, that's some social content. <laughs> well, it's not a comment. It's just, you know, yeah. they're stereotypically being like, oh, you can help us infiltrate, yeah, you, you know, they're saying, probably they're saying... You'd fit in. <laughs> yeah, they're basically saying you'd fit in. Mm-hmm. And, so and Ron Stallworth has to face prejudice both in investigation when he's undercover and in his police force in his own police force yes and of course Ron is trying to change things from the inside I think that becomes a goal of his oh yes very much and I mean I don't know how it went down in real life obviously but in the the scenes we see it's it looks like he's just flipping through the paper one day and then just decides to ring up the clan yeah uh he's just flipping through the newspaper he comes across his advertisement for the ku klux klan <laughs> which also it i mean it's crazy to think now how the clan just had advertisements in I mean, newspapers yeah who is editing i think it's called the colorado springs gazette like who's editing this <laughs> Who's letting this? I happen? mean, I mean, it's kind of like in that point in time when David Duke, and as he says, you know, they're trying to rebrand as like an organization, and he's trying to run for um, Louisiana governor. Mm-hmm. Trying to uh, quote unquote clean up the group's image. Yeah, yeah. He changes. I think he changes his title from Grand Wizard of the KKK to what? What Grand Director? Uh, I th- I think you're right. Yeah. Um, so obviously he sees this this uh, advertisement in the paper for the Ku Klux Klan. So he's like, okay, and he picks up his phone, like the phone on his desk, and he rings up the Klan. Yeah. Um, before that, 
uh, we get this scene where he's trying to infiltrate, because we talked about how they wanted him to go undercover with, like, narcotics, right? Yeah. And um, he goes to, he's got to go undercover at, like, um, this this uh, s- speech that um, a Kwame Tur is saying, run by the uh, student-led protesters. Mm-hmm. And... and it's at night, and... Uh, yeah, the police chief tells him, oh, the guy that's speaking is like a former Black Panther, and you need to you need to go to this speech and see if he's going to cause, like, any disturbances. Yeah, like incite mm-hmm. stuff to happen. Yeah. And while he's there, uh, what, what happens? He meets the president of the Black Student Union. I believe her name is Patrice. What's her name? Yep. Patricia? Patrice. Patrice, sorry. And he meets Patrice, and of course he starts talking to her, and he's got a wire on him, so he starts talking to her, like chatting her up, and then he goes inside, and he sees all, he sees this passionate speaker, and he's talking, the speaker's talking about like, oh, how we need to accept that we're black, and how... You know, we can't be afraid to be black anymore. Yeah, I should say, uh, play, he's played by Corey Hawkins. Uh, Kwame is. And does a, does a good job for the scenes that he's in. Yeah, he's a very passionate speaker. Yep. Uh, and then at the very end, you know, everybody's like, sh- everybody is like cheering and shouting. It's very like riled up in the room. Everybody's energized and then afterwards um ron and patrice they go back to like i don't know if it's like a club or just like some they're they're just dancing yeah the risk and then the you can club. tell very much by the music that ron's already catching feelings for her yeah and i think it should be said patrice isn't a real person no uh and she's not a real person she's completely made up for this movie just like a lot but i think it's i think it's smart because it like gets we get the perspective without her character we wouldn't have the perspective of the student-led protest yeah and and obviously this movie has to take some liberties in terms of changing up story yeah and i think it does that well and of course the like the student-led protest is like very they're very passionate, you know. They're uh, Patrice at the beginning. She doesn't even call cops cops. She just calls them pigs. Mm-hmm. Like they're very radicalized. And very early, you know, she thinks Ron is a cop. Yeah. Which he's he's technically a detective, but she doesn't find that out till later. Yeah. I mean, and I think he uh, he sets that up because there's one scene where they're like on a bridge and they're talking about. Right, Shaft and Superfly, all these black exploitation films, and she's like, he's like, which one do you prefer, Shaft or Superfly? She's like, Richard Roundtree, obviously. Like something like everyone loves a detective, and obviously he's a detective himself. Mm-hmm. So after after you get after you get this, uh, like he goes undercover and he goes to the speech. Afterwards. Uh, you know, he goes back. He goes back to the chief, and he's like, "Oh, it's okay. They're not gonna incite anything. They're fine." Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's just trying to diffuse the situation, basically. I guess we should get into some of these conversations he has over the phone, oh, and yeah. his 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 quote unquote initial meeting. Mm-hmm. So. So we. Uh, Oh, sorry. You go. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> uh, he uh, so he's on the phone, and then he doesn't get a response back from the clan. But then immediately after, he gets another call, and it's this uh, this guy Walter, who is a uh, white supremacist. And then um, you know, he's talking like, "Oh, what what draws you to the organization?" And then Ron's making up all this stuff like. So, you know, uh, my my sister married an African American and all this stuff, and he's coming up with all this stuff. He uses a lot of racial slurs, and um, he uh, 
he's like, well, we'd love to have you. Maybe we could get together sometime, work things out. Then when the call's over, the police officer is like, oh, that's great. It's just there's one problem. I don't think you should go to that. It's like, obviously. Oh, and Ron Slaworth, uh, he actually used his real name on accident. Yeah, which, you know, it's a, a little bit of a problem that they have to figure out a workaround for. Yeah. And so then we get uh, Flip Zimmerman, played by Adam Driver. Yeah. The great Adam Driver. And of course, Adam Driver is a terrific actor, and I think he does really well in this film. Well, yeah. Obviously. Adam Driver is... Uh, uh, I think he's, he's one of the best actors we have today, really. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, Anyways, talk about uh, the first uh, clan interaction with Ron. Okay, so once that phone call is over, uh, Ron and Ron go, comes and he's he comes to the chief and the sergeant and he's like, "Hey, help us with this investigation. Let us go on this investigation." And eventually, they convince the chief to. And so him and Flip start to like uh, they start to interact with each other, and Flip is going to be playing Ron Stallworth in front of the clan. So they meet up at like this. I don't know. They meet up at this place, and Ron Flip is just standing outside a car, and then a member of the clan pulls up and named Felix. Yeah, and I for I, I forget the name of the guy that plays Felix. He, it's like Jasper something. I don't know how to pronounce it, but he's he's like really intimidating and like weaselly and weird in this. Yeah, he. Whoever's playing him does a really good job of portraying Felix as a real sleaze ball. He's just like gr gr greasy and like a weasel type, uh -huh. and like yeah. bug eyed. And he's also like perceptive. Which is kind of scary because immediate, like one of the first questions he asks him is like, "Are you an ever undercover cop?" Well, and he also realizes that uh, Flip's Jewish. Yeah. Like, like who knows whether or not he says this to all their new recruits, um, but very early on, he's like, "I don't know, I don't know." He smells, he smells Jewish to me. Yeah, he says. Which, he even says like, "Oh, I can sniff him out." Which. Uh, and that leads to a very tense, like, a very tense scene where he, uh, he wants him, he wants Flip to take a, a lie detector test. Yeah. About if he's Jewish or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, it's like a very tense moment because uh, yeah. he's like trying to weasel his way out of this, and then Felix is like, "Let me see your dick," you know? Are you circumcised? Yeah. <laughs> and then Flip's like, "Oh, you're gay. You want to see my dick?" Yeah, and you get like this really funny interaction that's played for laughs. And you learn that Felix is like a Holocaust denier and all this bad yeah, stuff. And, yeah, that's that's the really that's a really good line. I'm glad you pointed that out. Mm -hmm. But then of course oh, sorry, continue. You go, you go. But then uh, you know, Flip is like, out of respect for this organization, I'm gonna take this lie detector test. And of course, he has to take the lie detector test because Felix is like holding a, a forty-five, <laughs> and yeah. you know he's threatening to shoot him. And of course, I bet Flip was freaking out because he's definitely gonna fail this lie detector test. But, but then he's... Ron comes and saves the day. He yeah. uh, throws something through the window. Yeah, Flip was wearing a wire, and Ron was on site, like listening. And once he notices that stuff is going down. He like runs to their lawn, gets like a pot. I think it's a potted plant, and he throws it through their window. And then Felix's wife freaks out, and she's like, "Felix, help!" And yeah. so both of them run out, and Ron runs back to the car and gets out of there. And they're able to uh, get away. Mm -hmm. Uh, we already touched on this briefly, but the uh, the members uh, forget who plays Walter. But I, he does a really good job. And then there's also uh, Paul Walter Hauser, who plays Ivan, the big guy. And he's, like, so dumb. Yeah, he's, he's kind of like the slow one of the group. 
Yeah, because there's scenes where they're going together and they're gathering guns, and then he just holds an empty gun at his head, and he's like, I know what I'm doing. Don't worry, I know. I remember when you were watching that movie, you were like, imagine if that gun just went off. <laughs> I, I mean, when I first saw that, I thought that's what was going to happen because they saw this guy's stupidity. Yeah, I mean, what if that was just set up? <laughs> I mean, Sp Spike Lee is not trying to be nice to yeah. these characters. He's very much pointing them out as the idiots and out just idiotic personas they are. But yeah, as with the movie, after that lie detector scene, and you know, they keep they keep on their investigation in the clan with Flip portraying Ron Stallworth, and he keeps on meeting with these guys, and he eventually, with inside information, they manage to stop a cross burning. Mm -hmm. So you got this scene where Flip is flip is there and walter comes up to him and is like i got good news you're gonna come to your first cross burning so and boom police ambush yeah so while once they're on the scene you know he's put the flip has a wire on him and let the police know what's going to happen so they keep sending patrol cars to like patrol the area yeah. and so they managed to stop this cross burning you know that's a victory it is the first victory of a few. Yeah, of many. Quote unquote victories. And of course, throughout this movie, you're getting scenes of Ron and Patrissa like hanging out. And. Mm -hmm. Oh, a very important scene that we forgot to touch on. When Patrissa and the speaker from earlier that Ron was sent to like listen to while undercover actually get pulled over by Officer Landers. Yeah, that, yeah. That racist one from earlier. Uh, and then she, and then he's like, you know, you could tell them all you want. Uh, nothing's going to happen. I could do this as much as I'd like. And then, of course, later, that will come to bite him. Yeah, of course. Like, during this scene, him and the officers made everyone get out of the car, and they're, like, antagonizing them, and he, like, sexually assaults Patrice. 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 Uh, so that'll come back to bite him later. Yeah. Uh, he... But anyways, uh, R Ron Stallworth is, he's building up his reputation, uh, in, in the clan, and then he, uh, gets a, gets a phone call from, uh, David Duke. Yeah. Played by Topher Grace. Mm-hmm. Uh... And I think Topher Grace is amazing. Yeah, he is. He manages to portray David Duke as like this charismatic guy, you know, as a leader figure who happens to be a leader of the KKK. I definitely say this is a is a little bit better performance than Spider Man Three. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, Ron Stallworth uh, calls uh, KKK headquarters, and he actually gets to talk with David Duke because. He's trying to see about his membership card. Yeah. So he can actually attend his first KKK march, which they are, which the clan is planning. Mm -hmm. And at the start, they're very adamant that this is going to be a non-violent thing, oh, you know. That and then really poorly. <laughs> later on, as like I think right when that shift of power happens, when. Walter decides to step down and he nominates Ron. That's when they're the other, uh, go, I was gonna say goons, <laughs> the other guys um, realize that this is their point in time where they could just be like, N -n We're going to do things a bit differently and maybe a little more extreme. Yeah, they basically become domestic terrorists. I mean, there's a. <laughs> There's a bomb. It's yeah. not a basically. <laughs> they are domestic terrorists. The freaking wife, Connie, makes me laugh so much with her facial expressions and the way she just overreacts to everything. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, David Duke's David Duke is so impressed with Ron Stallworth over the phone that he uh, 
he said, "Okay, I'll see your mem I'll see to it that your membership card is personally processed by me." Mm -hmm. And of course, now that David Duke is over it, it gets done real quick. And actually, uh, Ron he Stallings, decides to come down. Yeah. Then Ron Stallings. To, uh... Sorry, you go. Yeah, I was just saying he decided to. He's like, you know what? I'm going to come down to Colorado Springs, and I'm really excited to meet you, Ron. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so then you, then you, Ron Stallworth actually gets his KKK membership card, which is a very real thing. And I think that's one of like the best things to come out of this movie. They actually managed to fool David Duke and the entirety of the KKK. Well, I mean, it's also amazing to think like. You know, this is he has this card yeah. still. He has a, a black man has a membership card for the KKK. Wow! Like, there's just some like poetic justice and mm -hmm. irony there. That is beautiful. Yeah, they, they really pulled a fast one on the entirety of the KKK. And they're, they're trying to diversify members. Yeah. <laughs> diversify <laughs> okay one thing i think we need to bring up because i think we've been talking for too long and have barely touched on is uh spike lee's direction ah uh, yes i um, think sorry go you go no oh, okay well i think that he actually directs his actors very well oh yeah you can tell that these actors have been told what to how to like how to act it's very clear and I think that they, the direction is good. Yeah, you go. Well, I think, uh, well, Spike Lee, he's been doing this for decades now. And I think with um, this in 2018, and then um, he had The Five Bloods come out this year, um, I think he's, he's like hitting a, a renaissance in terms of filmmaking right now. And I think he is like at his technical best right now. And I'm excited to see what will come next from him, because sometimes he can be hit or miss. Um, but I think right now he's really on a hot streak. And um, another thing I want to say is we haven't even talked about uh, John David Washington, who plays Ron Stallworth. Oh uh, yes. I, uh, I think he does a fantastic job in this movie. Oh, I agree, and I didn't even know. He was Denzel's son. And it's funny to me because he got his, like, first film was Malcolm X um, back in the 90s, which was, of course, directed by Spike and starred his father. So I think that's really cool how he's now in a Spike Lee film of his own. Yeah. And I'm sure, like... You know, he they, like that. He didn't use that to like get that position. He earned that. Yeah, he definitely, and I think yeah, he definitely earns his performance in this movie, and he does a great job. I mean, you can, he can communicate things with like dial. He can communicate internal conflict within himself very well. I mean, you can really feel that Ron Stallworth is having trouble deciding you know he obviously meets the president of the black student union and black student union is pretty uh, radical they think that like a revolution of the system needs to happen but ron ha is in the police force and he's trying to change things from the inside he's he, very quick-witted yeah you can definitely feel kind of the the pull of these two forces within him it's very interesting well i mean even the the like the contrast he has to deal with when um, Patrice finds out that he is a detective and then he's just trying to protect her and the protesters there and um, he's like no you gotta listen to me there there's a pretty big potential threat that I could go down and I just want to protect your life and then obviously uh, you know she doesn't take too kindly to the fact that Oh, you've been lying to me. Uh, you didn't tell me you were a detective. Yeah. Yada yada. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, even even if he needs to like sacrifice his relationship with her, he's still willing to give himself away if he can protect her. I mean, even at the end of the film, uh, she says that she's like, I mean, I don't know if my conscience would be clear to let me sleep with a pig. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's clear that they like each other, and but her conscience and like what she's been promoting this is like the juxtaposition there is is real neat yeah I agree um okay we got David Duke comes to Colorado Springs and uh they uh, set up a big meeting with everyone another detail that we need to point out with with David Duke coming to Colorado Springs is that guess who the police force decide to assign David Duke's like he, they, David Duke needs a bodyguard since he's gotten death threats and they decide to assign Ron Stallworth the only black police officer which is great which yeah, like, it causes for very tense scenes yeah. of dialogue between them because and Ron's, Ron's just like, I'm, I'm just here to do my job, man. Yeah, Ron Stallworth is really scared that David Duke will recognize his voice because they've talked over the phone. Yeah. And, and he even says that he's like, wait, have we have we met before? Yeah. Or like something in that regard. I don't even know how that happened in real life. Like, why would the police chief ever decide to assign this? <laughs> well, I mean, if I mean, I'm just assuming. Um, obviously, if David did something to him right there, then they could just arrest. Maybe Duke. Maybe he's trying to provoke him. <laughs> well, you can definitely tell he's trying to provoke Ron with some of the things he says. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's trying to make him make Ron throw the first punch so we can actually like take action against him. Yeah. And of course, the clan sets up this big meeting. And all the while, during this meeting is when the uh, terrorist attack that the clan has been planning uh, is supposed to take place. Yeah, and they plan they're gonna put a bomb in uh, Patrice's like mailbox. Well, they originally yeah, like the mail slot. Yeah. Uh, they originally planned for that because you know they wanted to just blow this entire house away because they wanted to take out the leader of the Black Student Union. So that would obviously very clearly send a message. Yeah. And they decide that to pull off this mission, they're going to send Felix's wife, Connie, who is a bumbling buffoon. Yeah. She's obviously very clearly been like manipulated her entire life by Felix. Well, I don't even like she she wants to be a part. Yeah. I should... she's like she's like they will be in a meeting and she'll be like oh just let me know if you need help with anything honey and yeah just let me know if you need help planning terrorist organizations <laughs> uh so you know, they... family family bonding stuff family bonding fun for the whole family and so uh felix sends his wife carrying a little package of c4 to put in the mail slot so while this like situation is happening, there's there's like two events. There's the meeting with David Duke and the terrorist plot happening. Mm-hmm. And I think it, a good thing about like the like the little final act of this movie, I think they the two are balanced very well. Yeah, it's paced really well back and forth, as and a, it starts to build that tension nicely. Because right as Connie is like driving up to Patrice's house. You also discover that a member of the clan that Flip has just met playing Ron Stallworth actually knows that Flip is actually a cop. Yeah, he's like, this guy busted me a few years ago. Yeah. Flip actually arrested this guy, I think, for armed robbery. And so he he tells Felix, he's like, hey, that guy's not Ron Stallworth, that guy's a cop. And so... You get this like building tension because Felix decides to sit next to uh, to Flip at the dinner scene and with right next to David Duke. 
and then luckily Connie calls, so Flip has to go out and then take the call. Yeah, which buys some time for Flip. Yeah, so Felix like sits down, and he, immediately when he sits down, he's like, "Hey, Flip." He's like, uh, wh- wh- "Who's what are you that? talking about?" <laughs> and so Flip plays dumb, and then yeah, Connie Connie makes a call because the C four won't fit in the mail slot. I think we forgot to mention there's another scene also going on right now with the the Black Student Union. Is oh, having a, a meeting with uh, an older this wife this wife. older gentleman, and I forget the, the character's name, but I always forget that it's played by the musician Harry Belafonte, mm-hmm. and so whenever I see him, I just start singing like Deo, he's a Deo. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and this first this... time I saw that, it was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> And this older black man is telling us the real tale of the lynching of Jesse Williams, uh, a real life hate crime in which a uh, mentally retarded black man was un- unjustly hung on after he was falsely accused of raping and murdering a white woman. Yeah. And throughout this entire story, he's telling it to like a group of the I guess the Black Student Union. And they're all gasping because this really was a terrible tragedy. And so that's cutting back and forth between the clan meeting. Yeah. It's planning like, the bomb. Yeah, I think this movie managed this final act managed to balance like three events happening simultaneously. And Which are all leading to each other. Which because all... obviously Patrice is gonna eventually have to go home when we see her driving. When then we see Connie plant the bomb. And then flips leaving, and yeah, and so, it'll all can we know it's all gonna converge, right? And so Connie, Connie calls Felix. She's like, the bomb won't fit in the mail slot. I'm panicking, and Felix is like, go to Plan B. And then Patrice pulls up with her red car, and she goes inside the house. And so Plan B, I guess, was to throw the C4 under her car, and of course after because Ron, or Flip was wearing a wire. And so Ron gets in his car and he runs to try to find Connie to stop the bomb. And when he actually finds her and tries to arrest her, he's asking all these questions like, oh, where's the bomb? And he calls in all his units. He's like, all all officers in the area, uh, there's a bomb going on. I need, to, I need you guys to look for this girl. And when other officers arrive to help, they actually think that they don't believe that Ron Stallworth is a cop. Yeah, and since he's in streetwear, because he's undercover, and because he's black, so. And then Flip shows up, and he's like, "Hey, wait, what the fuck are you doing, guys? He's a detective." Yeah, and, and they're like, "Oh, sorry." And then... The cops, the cops are like, "Who are you?" He's like, "I'm, a, I'm a fucking cop." He throws in his badge, and so they free Ron Stallworth, and then the bomb goes off under Connie's car, and Felix was driving by in his own car because I guess he wanted to watch Patrice's house blow up. So he's driving by and he's right next to her car when it blows up. And so Felix's car gets like tossed over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One, of my, one of my favorite little parts uh, we didn't really touch on was uh, in the, the clan meeting, the fact that Ron Stallworth had the balls to take a photo of oh, David yeah. Duke and flips the one taking the photo it's and then right when he's like cheese he puts his arms around them and you could just see like how uncomfortable like David Duke goes like he looked like he was genuinely disgusted and then he's yeah. like what did you do boy well, yeah like what the hell did you think you just did Mm-hmm. And I just how that's done, and then he rushes over to get the Polaroid, and then the moment, yeah, the, and then the moment David Duke's like, "What the hell did you do, boy?" And then he has he he like he actually says like, "Lay a finger on me, I'll, I'll arrest your ass for assaulting an officer." And it, yeah, that's great because you know David Duke's gonna was he was gonna try and grab that photo and destroy evidence that of is. that even existing, mm-hmm. and that's out there now that exists in the world. Mm-hmm. And now that's turned into that was turned into this whole thing is turned into a book and now a film. Yeah. 
so after that, Connie gets arrested. Uh, I believe. Followed Felix. shortly by Felix. Yeah, Felix also gets arrested. And so now that you know the the bomb was the bomb didn't it only destroyed her Patrice's car. It didn't cause any like serious damage. Nobody actually died. So overall, is it it's a mission successful. Yeah. They they uh, they definitely stopped the clan because it could have definitely resulted in more deaths. They did. So we get back to the police station and the chief's telling them, uh, how, you know, you guys did a real great job, but then. He's like, we need to erase any evidence that this ever happened. Yeah, he's like, oh, we can't have the press catching wind that Colorado State officers were in the KKK, even though it was like a, a legit investigation. Well, I don't even know if it's that. I think it also might have been some underlying racism there within, within like, the police county still. Yeah, maybe. Like, not... Like, they may not have wanted to, um, you know, highlight uh, Ron's achievement this much. Yeah, maybe. Um, and, you know, everybody's kind of pissed about this. You know, you flip in, flip, walks out of the room, he's like, oh, this is bullshit. I know, and then, in retrospect, we obviously know that this story did get out. Yeah, and... the, the real-life Ron Stallworth, he was like, that is stupid. So instead of destroying the evidence, he just gathered up all the evidence and took it with him. Well, I mean, this is a, a fascinating and uh, yeah, like you can't let this powerful go story that needs to be told. Who doesn't like a story about the KKK getting fooled? And so he takes he takes the evidence home with him, and he eventually turned it into a book, which led to this movie. And um, I love that end scene oh. with uh ron and patrice where they got a uh either a doorbell or a knock and um they don't know who it is so they both grab guns and then you get this this shot of them walking forward and the camera pulling back and just the zoom mm -hmm. is done so well and then we don't know what happens and, and there's a burning cross outside their window yeah there's a burning cross outside but we... And I just think that ending frame of Patrice and Ron is great. Yeah. And with, we, we, we skipped over my personal favorite scene in this movie. Oh, please, go right ahead. This is when, right after the chief tells him to destroy all evidence, Ron Stallworth actually calls David Duke. Oh, yes. How could I forget? This is my favorite scene in the movie. And he calls David Duke... And then David, David Duke and him are like talking about, oh, it's so sad that the clan in Colorado Springs is basically destroyed, and how, uh, you know, Connie's gonna face serious charges for what she did. And then you get this scene where you know the investigation is over. So Ron Solworth, it just launches into. Uh, he starts saying like oh did you know who that he, he uses like he says do you know who that black detective was that was guarding you do you get his name and david duke is like no and then he goes into like he goes and he calls up he says a bunch of racial slurs and he's like that detective's name was ron stallworth and then he slams down the phone and it's great because earlier david is talking about how he can tell the difference in terms of voice between a a white person and an African American person. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and, but yet he's in that exact moment he's being fooled by Ron. Yeah. So it just shows like, oh yeah, he's here's an another way you're he's... also an idiot. Yeah. He's like, oh yeah, the way they pronounce certain things. Oh, what word is it? I forget what word yeah, it it's is. It's the but... AR sound. Yeah, yeah. And that's why later when he Ron saw him revealing himself, he says R, emphasizing the R. Yeah. Like, are you just sure about that? And so, you know, he slams down the phone, and you get this really good shot of David Duke just kind of, like, in, si like in shock. He's just sitting at his desk in shock. You know, he doesn't even put the phone down. He just has it up to his ear. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I don't... Obviously, nobody knows how this was originally going to end, 
but at the end of the movie, there's obviously news footage um, put in there from the uh, Charlottesville Nazi riot, yeah. riot uh, protests and all that interwoven with, you know, uh, stuff from the president and... Mm -hmm. uh, like stuff that happened recently that was in the news well like. yeah in 2018 mm -hmm. and then um it, it leaves you on this little thing of oh david duke was there in charlottesville and here he is endorsing the president and thanking him for allowing them to spread their opinions um, now i'm not saying anything one way or the other about politics but it's kind of that that doesn't shine a good light yeah. necessarily. It's kind of really scary that you know this movie takes place in what year I forget, but it's like the sixties, seventies. Yeah. And, but you know, it seems like yeah, that's how life was then, but it's not like that anymore. But it shows footage of like these neo Nazis and white supremacists in twenty seventeen. That's a year before this movie came out. And then David Duke's obviously talking at Charlottesville in 2017. And it's like, oh, wow. This is this might still be going on in some places of the country. Oh, very much is. And, yeah. um, I mean, I, it's crazy. I didn't even know that David Duke was just still out and about. Yeah. Just doing who knows what. All right. Because, I mean, it's not even like it's a secret that he does this stuff you know this is very well aware in the 70s and now and yeah and at one point he was even like a part of our government yeah he was running for office which yeah which is a very scary reality how sometimes people will try and go into government and yeah with these like terrible views yeah uh we should probably Talk about Academy Awards. This movie was nominated for a few. It's really was nominated for, yeah, quite a few. Um, this movie won one Oscar um, for Adapted Screenplay, mm -hmm. which uh, gave uh, Spike Lee his first Oscar, rightfully so. Yeah. And uh, I think it was deserving yeah, of... I think, uh, I think this, like, it, yeah, it's based. it was based on the book by Ron Stallworth. And I thought it, it did a great job of adapting his story. And it took just enough, it just took just enough creative liberty that I, th I thought it was fine. It, yeah. it definitely deserved this award. It's also crazy for me to think that this is the first movie in which Spike Lee was nominated for Best Director. Yes. Because, like, I don't know, Do the Right Thing in 1989 and who knows what else. Um, but, um... This was nominated for Best Picture. Yes, it was. And I, I think we should talk about that a right. little bit. Who because won Best Picture? Th this was the year Green Book won. Yeah. And everyone is was in uproar about, including myself. I remember watching that live and definitely not expecting that. I think this. I think a lot of people, in including us, thought that Black Klansman was going to win. I thought it really. Well, I didn't. I thought. Roma was the favorite. Uh, we could do a whole retrospective on this that year another time, but I thought Roma was the favorite going in. And I thought the kind of underdog one that had a chance was Black Klansman. That's the one I was personally rooting for out of yeah. all the options. I thought most of the options were um, like mediocre or decent in terms of films, and like the only ones I was really wowed by were like the favorite and Black Klansman. I think it should have won Best Picture, but... Yeah, I think it should have won Best Picture definitely over Green Book, I'll tell you that Green much. Green Book. Yeah, it was quite uh, a surprise when Green Book won. But, uh... You know? Yeah. Should I guess we, uh... Let's go into our wrap closing up? thoughts. Uh, would you like to start? Uh, sure. I think Black Klansman says a lot of I said I think it says a lot of things, and I think that it's shot very well. It's directed very well. Um, I think that the actors are doing a tremendous job, especially in the case of Adam Driver. I really liked his performance in this movie, 
and even uh, the person who the actor that plays Felix I think he also does an especially good job he does yeah. a really good job of portraying like this sleaze ball of a guy there's one person I forgot to mention who's like the other little cop there with Flip and Ron uh, his name's like Jimmy but oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the movie that taught me that Steve Buscemi has a brother named Michael Buscemi and because I was watching this the first time I was like that looks like Steve Buscemi but looks like Steve Buscemi under some heavy makeup yeah. wait a minute he has a brother <laughs> that's him Michael Buscemi uh, you f uh, finish up um, uh, yeah, I, th I think that this movie should have won the Academy Award for Best Picture, and I really like this movie. I'll probably rewatch it in the future. Yeah, I think it's pretty rewatchable. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree with you. I think performances are all well done. I think it's a it's a finely directed film, and um, it's just uh. It's crazy to think that this happened. Not all of it happened, but mostly this. It's just like a wild thing to think about, because like, you'd be, if you told me this was made up, I'd believe you. Yeah, I believe you. But the fact that it's, you know, we have the insight into what happened mm -hmm. and how it happened. Yeah. Makes it that much cooler. Now. Let's go into our ratings. Ratings? So, for this movie, Black Klansman, I gave this movie a 9 out of 10. High, high praise, yeah. or high praise. Um, I'm up there with you. I really enjoy this film. I'm going to give this film an 8.5 out of 10. Alright. Um, I guess we should say our goodbyes and our closings. And that wraps and then... up our episode on Black Klansmen. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you can, uh, you know, like it, I guess, or uh, comment. Let us know what you think about the movie. Uh, share it if a fr with a friend if you think you know someone who would like to listen to something like this. Um, let us know if you'd like us to cover any films in the future. Maybe we'll do them. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at CNC Commentaries. Um... Any final words before I give a little tease for next next time? No, oh, no, dude. Go ahead with the tease. All right. Get scared, everyone. Get very scared. Starting next time on the show, we will be j dropping into the world of horror, the world of spookiness for the Halloween October season. And uh, we're going to be starting off with a, a real barn burner. Um, we're going to be talking about a, a 1974 uh, slasher horror thriller film. One of the first ones to really uh, revolutionize that genre. I'm talking about a, a, a loving family tale. I'm talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. 1974's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, directed by Toby Hooper. That sounds going to be interesting because I haven't seen this one. Ha, it's going to be... I haven't seen this in a while, but I think it's going to make for a fascinating convo. All right, everybody. If you made it this far, we thank you for tuning in. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hey, wait a minute. Can I... I just need to bring this up right now, Nando. What? So on? we we started with a movie featuring Army Hammer. Yeah. And yeah. then we went to another movie that features Army Hammer. And mm -hmm. in that movie, there's a black guy using a white voice. Mm -hmm. And then we went from that to another movie that has a black guy using a white voice. What kind of shenanigans are you running? I'm running. You picked Sorry to Bother You. Uh, uh, what are you trying to say connecting <laughs> black clansmen to... Texas Chainsaw. I've never even seen the movie. I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're implying here. <laughs> well, listen, buddy. It's it's weird. You know what, Chase? You're weird. Well, you know what? Takes one to know one. Oh, you got me there.
You better edit this out of the episode. I'm actually going to put this in now that you said this. This is going to be our bonus clip. Fuck you. Oh, really? <laughs> Hi, who's the one? Goodbye.